we are live. Welcome to Gold Silver Pro Channel. It is Wednesday, January 27th. We have our big conference tomorrow. I want to welcome everybody to it. And uh, today was a big day. And I wanted to do a live session here to talk about what the FOMC uh, says they're going to do with interest rates. So as we can see here on CNBC, we got the Federal Reserve talking about leaving interest rates and asset purchases unchanged and sees asset growth slowing or growth slowing. The Federal Reserve kept its benchmark interest rate anchored near zero following the conclusion of its two-day meeting Wednesday. Along with the commitment to zero rates, the central bank said it will keep buying at least $120 billion of bonds a month. And the post-meeting statement noted that growth has moderated in recent months. In addition to repeating its belief that the path of the economy is dependent on the virus progression, the statement added progress on vaccinations to its watch list. So we're going to look at the difference between this FOMC meeting minutes versus the last one to see how they've changed slightly. But essentially, the Fed is going to remain dovish, and they're going to let the spigots, uh, the monetary spigots wide open, and the government's about to go spend, 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 so we can expect that that's coming. Um, consistent with market expectations, the policymaking Federal Open Market Committee said it was keeping its benchmark short-term borrowing rate anchored near zero in maintaining an asset purchasing program that is seeing the Fed buy at least $120 billion a month. So QE forever, like we predicted several years ago, I think I wrote about this in Seeking Alpha in 2018, QE forever, it will never stop. And so far, that prediction has come true. At the core of the move to keep policy historically accommodative was an economy in which the sectors most vulnerable to the pandemic are taking the hardest hit. The pace of the recovery in economic activity and employment has moderated in recent months, with weakness concentrated in the sectors most adversely affected by the pandemic, the committee's post-meeting statement said. The statement reiterated that COVID-19 is causing tremendous human and economic hardship across the United States and around the world. And I would say that I think it's the actual lockdowns which are causing that because I don't believe this virus is killing people like the Spanish flu or the Black Plague. Yes, there are some deaths and yes, people are getting sick, but I think it's the shutdowns in, in reaction to that which has been causing the economic harm, whether or not you believe the shutdowns were warranted, I guess is, you know, we could talk about that. And, and some people would say it is, and some people would say it's not. And that's probably a healthy argument for us to have. But I want to reiterate, it's not the virus, it's the shutdowns, which is causing the economic issues. They go on to say the path of the economy will depend significantly on the course of the virus, including progress on the vaccinations. The decision means that the Fed funds rate, which serves as a benchmark for a variety of consumer debt instruments, will remain anchored in the range between 0 and 0 0.25, most recently trading at 0 0.08. What that means is the Fed will have no policy response in the event that we suffer a massive, massive deflationary recession. They will not be able to uh, lower interest rates because they're already at the zero bound unless they go negative. I've been talking about negative interest rates coming to the U.S. system uh, soon, I believe that they will on our next downturn whenever that happens to occur. We've already seen negative interest rates around the world, I think to the tune of 16 or 17 trillion in negative interest rate debt around the world. So we are not uh, alone here in the U.S. This has definitely been occurring in Europe and everyone el everywhere else. It says here, Fed officials remain cautious on the economy that has seen a two-speed recovery with earners in upper income brackets doing well. And those at the bottom, particularly workers and service industries, faring poorly. And the disparities form much of the impetus behind the Fed's flexible average inflation targeting regime. Uh, CNBC also has this nice document here on what has actually changed. They removed text from the December statement, uh, basically crossed it out, and they added text that they added to it since December. So it hadn't changed much, but there are a couple of key uh, changes here. Uh, instead of the pace of economic recovery continuing to recover, they are now saying it's moderated in recent months and weakness concentrated in the sectors most adversely affected. So they were a little bit more bullish in December than they are now. Now they're retracting that. And the path of the economy will depend significantly on the course of the virus. And they've added including progress on vaccination. So they're, they're saying they believe vaccinations will slow the virus, which will then help the economy. And the health crisis continues to weigh on economic, economic activity. They don't see a difference there. So that is the difference between what they said in December and now they're becoming more negative overall on the economy and more positive that the virus is continuing to affect it and that's why they didn't change anything on their guidance. Meanwhile, the Democrats prepare to pass a relief bill without Republican votes. They're gonna try to ram it through 
the house and the senate they're preparing initial steps to use budget reconciliation to pass another current coronavirus relief package house majority leader steny hoyer added votes to the house is scheduled to start the reconciliation process and chuck schumer said democrats will have to move forward without republicans so because they have control of both the house and the senate they're going to push through this plan they started to lay the groundwork to pass the next relief package without republican votes and house majority leader uh, added votes to the chamber schedule next week that will give us the option of using budget reconciliation budget reconciliation is really a shortcut for if you don't get the votes we've got this shortcut process to where we can get it anyway uh, the house majority leader told lawmakers he could change the schedule again before march 14th to allow time to renew um, so on and so forth uh, biden and the democrats have pushed to inject more money into into the health into health care and Biden wants uh, 1.9 trillion. So they passed a $900 billion bill and now they're wanting to go to 1.9 trillion. Hence the title of the presentation, the, F the Fed remains dovish or accommodative, if you will, with their monetary policy while the Democrats and the government is going to spend, spend, spend. And I think that will lead to inflation as I've been talking about. Here's another one from Biden. He's talking, uh, he's suspending oil and gas leasing and a slew of executive actions on climate change. So essentially what we're doing here is shutting down new leases for oil and gas while they ramp up the climate change controls. What is this going to do to the energy industry? When you don't renew leases, you can't produce energy. That's going to slow the pace of energy production, making the U.S. less energy independent. And that's going to put upward pressure on energy prices here in the U.S. and for our trading partners. It says here, President Joe Biden on Wednesday signed a series of executive orders that prioritize climate change across all levels of government and put the U.S. on track to curb planet warming carbon emissions. He orders, the direct, he orders direct the Secretary of the Interior Department to halt new oil and natural gas leases on public lands, and the series of actions kick off the president's agenda to reduce the country's emissions and establish stricter targets under the Paris Climate Accord. So they're going to go back to the Paris Climate Accord, and they're going to slow the energy creation, which is going to raise energy prices we believe and that's what's coming on energy we saw if you remember last week uh, i did a section on energy how energy prices had spiked most of the energy prices had been spiking since about november time frame but really year to date in 2021 they were really ramping up and i think what's going to happen is you can expect oil gas and gas at the pump natural gas and gas at the pump to go up with these new executive orders that's what's going to happen more inflation 2021 i believe for all of these reasons meanwhile we had big news today because td ameritrade put restrictions on transactions in gme and amc so the market has been talking about these two stocks uh, they have just been slamming forward there's been a short squeeze the shorts are getting squeezed out of their positions while the retail market bids up these stocks it's been pretty funny to watch uh, people panicking because of that. And so TD Ameritrade just put, started putting transact, uh, restrictions on the transactions to kind of slow the retail market down as if uh, the hedge funds shorting this and the big money shorting this needed help. They're the big money. They're big boys with big pants on. Personally, I don't think they need the help, but you can see that's what TD Ameritrade is doing to slow the short squeeze in Jimmy and AMC. I think it's pretty funny. I think they should just let the market decide uh, what it wants to do. But in any case, that's news there. Uh, well, there's several retail brokerage that suffer widespread outages as a short uh, squeeze surge accelerates. So not only was it uh, TD Ameritrade, you also had all these other Robinhood, E-Trade, Charles Schwab, Ally, Fidelity, TD Bank, Honeywell, Google, Waze, Merrill, so on and so forth. So widespread outages as people piled in uh, long on these trades to slam the short traders. Of course, you've seen the prices just explode and they're making money hand over fist and it's slamming the retail brokerages. It's pretty funny what's going on. Uh, that's, see, ladies and gentlemen, that's why you have to be really careful with the short squeezes or uh, going short something because if, if the market decides, uh, whether it be a big player or whether it be retail, if they decide that they wanna call you on your bet, uh, yeah, you can get slammed on that pretty hard. And when you're in a short trade, you can lose everything. Going short uh, carries the, the infinite risk with it. You can lose and just keep losing, keep losing and get margin called on your account. Meanwhile, there's a big bet. Nancy and Paul Pelosi bought more than a million dollars in Tesla, Disney, and Apple calls in December. You know, it's always funny when people in Congress do this because you have to wonder what legislation is coming down the pike that they know about that they can put a million dollars into these calls 
And when they're putting million dollars into calls, they're expecting to uh, Tesla, Disney, and Apple uh, to continue to, to rise in price, right? So then putting calls on it, it's basically a bet on the direction. Well, what do they know about what legislation is coming up? Maybe there's legislation coming up that's going to, uh, that's going to create new government contracts uh, with these companies and other companies. And I just find that really funny. So they're going massively long. Uh, you know, can we short squeeze these guys on their call positions? Uh, meanwhile, um, in the silver market, you know, you wonder what happens. People are short squeezing uh, these two uh, stocks over here, GME and AMC, uh, at the same time that there's a short squeeze going on in silver. Now, the, the stock uh, shorts are, are taking it right now because the retail market is punishing them. What happened if we did this in silver? What if the retail market woke up and said, you know what? We've got this massive short position sitting on silver in the COMEX. What if we go massively long? What if we just start opening futures positions long? You can see what's basically happened to silver. If you look at a chart uh, dating back to the beginning of the year, it's gone from about 27 bucks to about 25 something. Uh, this is about a $2 move down in silver, which is pretty significant at that price level. Why has it been moving down? Well, if you look at the settlements, it's because the futures. Uh, on the March contract, uh, as far as Wednesday's data goes, today's data goes, there were 39,000 contracts that closed at 2538. So when you have all these derivative positions sitting on top of uh, the silver market, it's dragging the price down. What if all of the people that were going long on uh, GME and AMC decided to pile into silvers? What silver price would we get? Uh, maybe we would get you know, $35 silver, $40 silver, who knows? But I think it would definitely be worthwhile to see what would happen if, if uh, we got on the other side of the, the short silver trade. Uh, lastly, on this, before I open it up to questions, I want to talk about our conference, Solutions 2021. It is tomorrow. We're actually opening up an hour early at 10 a.m. to come in for guys to mill about. We'll start the content, content at 11 a.m. This is all Central Standard Time. Uh, you can register for free by going here hopin.com events solutions 2021 looks like we got about 700 people coming that is awesome it's going to be a really fun conference we had all the speakers confirmed so we are all booked up it's going to be a lot of fun if you guys want go ahead and join us at the conference uh, we'll be live all day long we'll be uh, live in the after party afterwards if you want to come and ask questions of some of the speakers and myself we'll be there for the after hours party you can ask me anything you want. I'll answer the best of my ability, and we'll just have a whole lot of fun. So that is Solutions 2021 tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Content starts at 11. So big news with the Fed, big news with the spending from the government, and uh, big news with some of the short squeezes in the stock market. Boy, wouldn't we like to see that in silver. Uh, Want to see some of your questions. If you guys have questions, uh, open them up in the chat. I see uh, Rodrigo talking about uh, now you're talking business. Go silver, go. That's right. Uh, gold, silver pros. That's what we do. Uh, do you guys? Let's see if we have any questions here in the chat. Yeah, I know my volume's a little low. I'm going to shout into the mic. We've got a new setup and we're still uh, working on that. Uh, thank you for letting us know. So what's happening? Uh, Paul wants to know. So what's happening with the price of gold? with the feds keeping low interest rates well what happens is if you get negative interest rate gold does really well or if you have high inflation gold does really well what we're doing is we're just sitting in this lull in interest rates so i don't think it's going to affect gold at all and i think gold is in a consolidation pattern so the next catalyst and i was on with um kai hoffman on his channel this morning live on sf live sore financial we were talking about just this i said if we get really high inflation we'll see gold run if we have some sort of black swan in the banking system, we'll see gold run. And if we go to negative interest rates in the U.S., we'll see gold run, meaning if the interest rates come back down. Those are three scenarios in which we could see gold run. I think people are waiting and seeing what the administration is going to do before they pile into gold. And I'm talking futures positions. Uh, I think they're already there physically. Last year on the COMEX, we delivered more physical gold than, than I can recall ever seeing on that market. So people are taking physical delivery. But the futures positions, people are just sitting in this trough. They're just waiting to see what happens. They're waiting for a catalyst. So now is the time to accumulate gold if you want it. You're going to get it cheap before we get that next catalyst. When the catalyst comes, people are going to pile uh, back into gold. So Peter says, all the news are bullish for gold and silver, but the prices are still consolidating. It does not make sense. Yes, I agree it's bullish for gold and silver. However, you have to consider it from 
uh, the big players' perceptions, they're not going to bid gold and silver up really until people come in in a panic trade or worrying about the economy, worrying about food, worrying about interest rates. That's when you're going to see people pile into gold. So I think, again, we're consolidating, but we'll get there. Rob asks, what stops the physical market for gold and silver at the LCS level from just disconnecting from the paper futures price? Disconnection of the physical and the papers market happens when, they're pan when there's a panic. We saw earlier this year in March, April timeframe, we saw the premium spreads blow out. We saw them blow out between the COMEX and the LBMA. We also saw them blow out in the retail market because people were panicking into physical. When people panic into physical and they take all available supply, that's when you see the sellers stop offering physical at the paper market or the spot market price when that occurs. We're not in a panic right now. Right now, again, we're in consolidation. People are kind of sitting there going, the stock market's doing well. We expect the, the, the government to start spending a bunch of money. They think that that's positive for the economy. So people are going to sit tight and wait. So until we get some of these, uh, these crisis things going on, people are going to pile back in. Now, if they go back to shutdowns, people are going to pile back into gold and silver. Uh, if we have a bank failure, people are going to pile back into gold and silver. If we have a huge stock market correction, people are going to pile back into gold and silver. Let's see what else. Miners took a pummeling today. Yes, they do. The miners are speculative investment, much like the futures. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Whenever the miners come down, especially gold miners, when we're sitting at 1850 gold and the gold miners are printing money, pile into the miners. It's a cheap way to get the miners. Most miners will make money at 12, in the range from 1050 to 1350. 1250 is sort of the sweet spot. So if you've got a miner that's producing or is very near-term near production, uh, you've got a six, $700 uh, cash, cash flow on every ounce produced. I would say go into miners if it's a good quality miner. Of course, you want to look at management. You want to look at jurisdiction. You want to look at project quality. Do your risk assessment, but pile in because you've got a six, $700 profit on every ounce produced. So if they're near-term producer or producer, uh, I, I say this is a buying opportunity. If it's in the expiration, judge you know where how far they are in expiration. Those are going to go up and down anyway, depending upon their new cycle, not as much the gold price. So it depends on how much of a, a deposit they have as to how much uh, institutional money is going to pile into those explorers. So explorers are a little bit different between producers. So that's a little bit more of a gamble anyway. But if you find a good explorer, go ahead and buy shares and don't worry too much about the fluctuation. Again, we're very profitable in terms of gold price. I'm not too worried about it. Let's see what else. Uh, is this a virtual conference only? Yes, it is a virtual conference. We're not meeting physically because a lot of the people that attend this conference would have to go into lockdowns. They would come down from Canada or from other states. It would be virtual only. Uh, when a lot of the quarantine procedures are eased and we no longer have to quarantine for two weeks, we will do a physical conference. I'm hoping that in August when we run the Money Metals Summit, we will do a physical conference. Uh, last year that was virtual for the same reason. If things open up this summer, we'll find a local place here in Texas. We'll do a physical conference so you can fly in if you want, and I'm sure we'll get a lot more physical attendance there. So yes, but for tomorrow's conference, for those reasons, it's virtual, which is actually kind of cool uh, because you can just sit there at your home computer and attend. You can also attend on your phone if you wish, and uh, I think it'll be awesome. Peter Frowine says, time to buy more gold and silver now. I agree with you, Peter. It's time to load up, back up the truck. In which time frame would you expect gold to be in new all-time high or at least $2,000? I said on Kai's program this morning on SF Live, I believe this year we're going to hit 2000 And I think when we have the next catalyst, which is going to be rising inflation in consumer prices, when it's going to be negative real interest rates in, in the U.S. economy, when that sinks in, because we're already there, and w or when we have a bank failure, black swan, I think we're permanently going to go above 2000 We won't come back down for a very long time. That will happen sometime in 2021. I don't know which catalyst it will be, but I would put my money on inflation and increasing negative interest rates. Increasing negative interest rates across the world in the debt system to try to entice people to buy debt as we near the end of this debt system, and you have to entice, you have to basically uh, go negative interest rate to, to keep your financing costs down, and also inflation and consumer goods. I think that's going to drive gold past 2000. I think that will come. And again, if you look at what we're talking about here, Federal Reserve is going to remain accommodative. That means more debt, 
more lending, okay? Excessive debt and lending in every sector, in corporate, in personal, and in uh, governmental. And I think uh, we're gonna see prices rise. Commodity prices are gonna rise. Availability of, of, of products is gonna become a question. That's gonna increase the price for gold. Gold is not gonna go to like 2,800, 3,000 though until we have that black swan. So I wanted to make that point. When we hit a black swan, we hit a bank failure or a major failure in a sovereign bond market, uh, all bets are off at that point and gold's gonna go where it goes. And it ain't gonna matter what paper scheme you have. Forget the COMEX, forget the LBMA. When it runs, it's gonna run, but it's gonna be one of those black swans. And when you hear about a black swan, you're not gonna be able to get gold. Five minutes later, all the physical is gonna be claimed. All the, the phone lines into all of the dealers are, are gonna be filled up and you're not gonna be able to get it, forget it. So now's the time to get it when it's in consolidation because when we hit that black swan, forget it. Uh, you may not be able to get gold again for a very, very long time. All right, let's see. Um, good evening. Uh, Dale Wakefield says, do you not think the banks and the Fed have a money in Bitcoin? I do and think uh, that can mess with that. Your thoughts, bro. All right, yeah. I do think that all markets are, are manipulated using the Fed and using the exchange stabilization fund. As well, remember, there are Bitcoin futures on the CME group. So uh, where there are any sort of futures trading, it can be manipulated. And remember, not only are there gold, wheat, and all commodities futures, there's now Bitcoin futures. In the other currencies, there's another market, I forget the name of it, it's Delta or something in which they have futures. So now all the cryptos are trading in the future market. Those are all gonna be manipulated. And I mean, basically it's all a derivative driven market. So yeah, all the markets are manipulated up and down to suit uh, the taste of the big money in each market. And when you have all this money slashing around in the system, that means all of those assets get bid up. That's why we've had asset price inflation, okay, but deflation in the general economy. That's basically what's going on. Wet Rodrigo Pace, or Pice, I'm sorry if I'm uh, pronouncing your name correct, incorrectly, says, when will the reset be? Well, the reset, quote unquote, is going on right now. If you look at the World Economic Forum, it's underway. If you look at the BIS and the IMF, it's underway. Their plans are in place. Uh, the reset is different than the crash. The reset is where they put the infrastructure in place so when the crash happens, they're able to flip the switch and go over to the what I think is going to be the digital currency system. Uh, that's my personal opinion. But the, the process of building the infrastructure is in place. I do think it may be a couple of years before we get the big, big crash because I think they're trying to keep the system on life support until they can get all the digital currencies in place, uh, all of the negative interest rates and the banking system in place, all of those things, until they can get the next currency regimes and the, net, the next debt-based regimes in place. So, it, I mean, it could be a year to two years. Um, I've been speculating, you know, 2022, 2023 maybe. We'll have to wait and see. It's gonna be dynamic because, like I said, they're building a system that's never been built before Nobody knows the exact date. I don't even think they know the exact date yet when they expect the system to crash. So it's very dynamic. New systems being put in place, old system dying. You know, they're pumping oxygen into it and putting it on the respirator to keep it from completely dying uh, because nobody, you know, wants to go into complete chaos. They want to have some framework and system in place. And those frameworks are being put into place. Basel III is part of that. Uh, the IFR to SOFR interest rate system is part of that going to a derivatives driven interest rate benchmark, okay? That's, I, uh, I, I'm sorry, LIBOR to SOFR. Um, and all of that, all of those interbank lending rate changes, the cryptocurrency systems, it's all part of the reset. That infrastructure is being built now. I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, have you seen the red thread about the silver squeeze? Yes, I did, and that's why I brought up silver. It's why I put silver on the screen. I have seen the Reddit thread. It's basically like Max Kaiser's, it, it reminds me of Max Kaiser's uh, uh, bankrupt JP Morgan by bidding up silver and buying all the silver. It didn't really work last time. I don't know if it'll work this time. Uh, it could, but I think we'll get that silver, that real gold and silver bid when we have our next big crisis. I, I do like the fact that they're trying to get people involved on the retail side. I definitely do like that. but. I think when you have the rush to the exits of the financial system and people into gold and silver is when you get that big, uh, that big price swing that everybody's been looking for. Okay, Nilly Nush says, despite the repo markets crashing before 
Uh, it is now being used as scapegoat for the entire ongoing agenda. I'm not sure I understand quite what you're saying there. Uh, Third World Trillionaire says, there's a hilarious thread on Zero Hedge, Wall Street Bets responds to the SEC. <laughs> uh, question from Maria Georges. Do you think gold will have a role to play in the Great Reset? Yes, gold is a tier one asset. The central banks have been buying like mad, and I mean mostly the Eastern ones, but maybe some of the central ones. So it's going to be the basis of the monetary system they're not wanting people to own it as much. They're wanting the central banks to own it, and then they're going to put some sort of digital currency on top. So that's gold's role. Gold is going to be the stability factor in the next system. That's why there's hoarding gold on the COMEX vault. That's why a lot of the gold is moving to the elite uh, so they can have their personal share. That's why the central banks are getting it. That's the basis for everything. That's the rock upon which everything stands. And I think they're going to give cryptocurrencies to the people, but gold is going to enter underpin all of that. And that will be gold's role. Now, if you're getting gold for your account, you're going to have tremendous purchasing power when the next, uh, when the reset occurs and the next currency system comes into play, you're going to be like your own little central bank and literally be able to print money. And I think that will be the value of gold. So get into gold for the long term and don't do it in the GLD or other paper assets do it in real physical and when you have a good real physical position and you want to speculate then you go into the gold mining stocks dasmo says you mentioned xrp and ripple as a replacement for the swift system how does the recent sec crash affect this so the commercial banks designed xrp to be the replacement for swift but there is a war going on between the central banks the regulators and the commercial banks so I don't know if XRP is going to emerge here. They've come under a lot of pressure. The SEC basically slapped them on the wrist. Uh, they took a big crash price-wise. The commercial banks want XRP to be the SWIFT system. Uh, they want Finality to be, um, to be their, their monetary system for the central banks, but I think, I'm sorry, for the commercial banks, but I think the central banks are having some words with them. So I think it's a spat between Little and Big Brother We'll see what happens. I don't think the book is closed on XRP right now, uh, but we'll have to see what happens there. Rodrigo asked another question. So you think China will be part of the big reset or they have their own plan? They have their own plan, but think about it like this. You have different, uh, I'll use uh, Chris's example from our live stream the other day. They're like mafia bosses, right? Or they're like, uh, they're big families. They have their own plans, but they're aligned. Everybody's going to go to to the digital currencies, and yes, they're all going to be part of the, the the Great Reset. If you look at the World Economic Forum, if you look at the Council on Foreign Relations, if you look at the G20 and the G12, all of those meetings, the East and the West are meeting to discuss strategy there. That's where they're lining up their strategies. So yes, they're going to do the same thing. They're just going to do their own implementations. It's like different flavors of ice cream. You got vanilla here, you got chocolate here, you got strawberry here, you know, you got Neapolitan here. They're all going to basically do the same thing, and but it's going to be different flavors. They're all going to control it, okay? But they're all going to connect together, and that's taking the system digital. When they take it digital, all they got to do build those connections. So you got system A talking to system B. You don't have to worry about system A and B exactly the same. They just have to be able to talk to each other. This happens in computers all the time, and that's why they're going digital. It facilitates this much more quickly than what they can do now with all these manual-based systems. No, thank you, uh, Rodrigo. I got your name correct. So happy. Bruby, okay, you need the real coins of gold, silver to break the paper market once and for all. I read an article that says it exists 250 times more paper silver than the real ones. Uh, Bruby, you are correct. There is a ton of paper on top of the, the physical market. So yes, you want to have physical, not paper. And by paper, I mean the GLD or futures positions. Go the physical coins. If, if you're worried about storage, you can sign up with Glint. It's on my website. I have an affiliation with them. It, ha it helps me, but it helps you get your gold in safe storage, and you can spend it using a debit card. So you have immediate access to it. You don't have to fly across the world. That's a nice little compromise between having safe and secure storage and being able to spend it with that debit card. That's one way, or you can find any storage place uh, that you want. I believe Miles Franklin has one. Uh, I believe lots of companies have one, so you can find one if you want to save, if you're worried about physical storage. Maria, you're welcome for answering your question. I hope, I hope that did answer. If you have any others, let me know. Um, let's see. 
Dale Wakefield, thanks for that. Do you think we have a 2008 crash again when all the banks crash and take all your fiat? So like here in the UK, if you have more than 85K in the bank, you're screwed. Okay, yes, good question. We have the FDIC scheme here in the United States, which guarantees, I believe, now up to $250,000 per bank account. However, as it's been documented by myself and also Lynette Zhang on her YouTube channel, ITM Trading, there's only one cent for every dollar saved in the banking system. So let's say you have an account of $100,000, or just say you have $1 in the bank. The FDIC has only funded one cent per dollar, so you would only get a cent uh, return. And I think it's even worse than that because the people that redeem it first are gonna get more of that money. So let's say we have a big banking crash and you have 100,000 in the bank. If you go really quick, you might get 20,000 of it. The next person may get 10,000, the next person may get 500, the next person may get nothing. They're gonna dole it out as they can, but that system is gonna break. And yes, I think next time when we have the big crash, they're gonna have to let it crash all the way because I don't think they can save it this time. I think we will, they can't resuscitate. There's too much debt, it, it, it has to crash. So we're at the very end. So when it does crash, yeah, you wanna have your cash out of the system, you wanna have your gold and silver, uh, you wanna have your, your mining stocks or whatever, whatever your plan is. Peter asked me a question on my assets. He says, what percentage of your assets are in physical gold, silver, and what percentage are in gold, silver miners? I think I did answer this in a recent chat, but I'll answer it again. I would say about 40% of my wealth is in physical gold and silver, safely stored in storage, not kept at home. I want to reiterate that. I, you know, I don't want a home invasion or invite anybody over. We have it in safe storage. I pay for that storage. I'm perfectly happy to do so. About that's 40%. 40% is, well, I would say probably about 30% is in farmland, productive farmlands here in Texas where I have a nice long growing season because even more so than gold, they're not making any more farmland, right? So if you can put animals on it or you can grow crops, farmland is really valuable, especially in hard times. I know because my mother and father grew up during the Great Depression, my mother grew up on a farm and that's how they survived. So farms can be worth even more than gold and silver when you have big depressions or big recessions. The other, I think that leaves 30%. I'll say uh, the rest is in cash and miners. So I do have a fairly large cash position. I am in some miners, but I'm kind of waiting to get further into miners or real estate until we have the big crash because I'm gonna pick up some bargains. So there's some companies I believe in, but there's some other companies I'm prospecting right now from the miner perspective that I will get into when we have the next crash because I think they're gonna be even bigger bargains than they are now, even though they're big bargains right now, historically speaking. Uh, let's see. Christian asked the question, First Majestic Silver has gone up 12% since market closed. Oops, I'm going to have to scroll back up. You guys are in the, active in the chat here. Okay, First Majestic Silver has gone up 12% since market closed. Any idea what's driving the price up? The silver spot remains the same. Yeah, I think people are calling out the shorts on First Majestic just like they are on the two stocks that we talked about, uh, AMC and was it GME? Uh, I, it looks to me like the retail bidders are going to bid everything up. Of course, part of that's euphoria. First of all, I think that people shouldn't be too short First Majestic because I think their potential value, their net asset value, bounces in the ground. And even $26 silver is tremendous. It's more than their current price. And if silver goes to 30 and 32, uh, the amount of profits they're going to generate from that is ridiculous. But from a discounted cash flow position and what they're actually producing now at silver's price, they may be slightly overvalued, so they have a short position. But I think the retail investors are saying, wait a minute, we were looking at silver long term, let's bid this up. And I think they're calling the shorts out. We'll see what happens. Are they gonna short squeeze First Majestic? We'll have to see how far this goes. Uh, if banks crash, how does it affect exchanges under them? Well, it, if you look at Basel III, what Basel III is trying to do is, is stabilize the exchanges as well as the banks. Because the banks facilitate the exchanges and where they have derivative positions that are piled on top of each other, that's systemic risk. So yes, you can take a market down if you take a bank down. That's why they bailed out Lehman. It wasn't just gonna take the banks down, it was gonna take the market. So they're intertwined. So yes, you have to be careful being in any derivative market when the banks go down. You could lose your value, so just be careful with that. Uh, Dale has a follow-up question. How would you know when to take your cash out of the bank? Well, now, <laughs> don't wait. Put it in gold and silver, put it in glint because if you need to you know, go buy groceries or go to the restaurant or buy tires, you just use your glint debit card.
that's the great thing about Glint is it's physical storage. In gold, you get the benefits of it, but it's like cash. So that's a good way to do it. Or put your cash somewhere else. I mean, how, think about strategy. You could do that. Don't, you know, don't tell people you're taking cash out of the bank, but put it someplace safe, but just get it out of the banking system if you can. Now, keep enough cash in there to pay your bills and stuff and, and, and uh, meet your obligations, uh, but just have cash somewhere safe. Glint's a great opportunity. That's why I'm affiliated with them because it's a nice little uh, connection between gold, silver, and the ability to spend it. So basically, it's like cash. Uh, let's see. Peter says, a, a question on digital currencies. Having the digital currencies, do we need commercial banks in the bond market? Um, yes and no. If, if The article I wrote a couple of years, well, about a year and a half ago, uh, which I talked about the relationship between negative interest rates, mon monetary, modern monetary theory, and digital currencies, all that stuff. When they go fully digital, not in the current system, when they go fully digital, they don't need bonds. They don't need debt. Because what they're going to do is everything's going to be connected. They're going to push a button, create currency, push a button, suck currency out. Literally like that. They won't need to issue debt. They're going to control it through your banking system. They're going to control it through the markets. Or at least they believe so. This is basically the communist monetary system. Um, I, I hate to say it, but that's the system that they're designing. Now, whether that stands up and how long that stands up, Rafi and I had a really d good discussion on that on Chris's channel on Arcadia Economics the other day. We have slightly differing opinions, but that is the system. And no, you would not need debt. In fact, if you look at the IMF paper that I quoted that was written in 2015, they're proposing getting rid of debt altogether. So I don't know if that means jubilee or crash the system and revalue. I, I tend to think crash the system and revalue. But eventually they're going to get rid of debt as we know it today because of the negative interest rates both in uh, the banking system and in uh, the monetary system. That's how they're gonna, they think that they're going to control it. Oh, thanks, Oat MMC, for making the comment about using Glint in the U.S. and it being great. I use it as well. Uh, I love it. I've never had an issue with it. I buy gas. I buy groceries. It's perfect. All right, I'm going to answer one more question from Emery, and then we're going to wrap it up, guys. Thank you so much. Emery asks, comparing chart pattern of 2011 before gold long-term sell-off from 1900 to 1000 and this current chart before all-time high, which looks similar, can you give us a comment about this? Yeah, the sell-off from 2011 to, I guess, earlier this year, or late 2018, uh, w was a massive sell. It was about 700 bucks. It was, I don't know, 35 40% of the market. The sell-off we've had recently is very minor. It's like 10 to 12% correction. It's not the same thing. And when gold sold off from 1900 to 1100 I think it was like 1190 or something like that. No, it was 10-something. Uh, that was a consolidation phase, and that's why we've had the ramp back up to 2070, and now we're consolidating or doing a short-term pullback to the 1830, 1850 range. We could go down to, to high 1700s. If we do, that finishes up the cup and handle pattern I've been talking about since 2011. That tells you we're on to the next leg of the bull market. So we could come down a little bit here, but I don't. we're not going back down to 1,000. I hope that answers your question. Uh, okay, guys, I think that's going to do it for today. Thank you guys so much for joining the channel. Remember, join the conference. I'm going to put that back up on the screen. Uh, I think we've had a couple more people join since the live stream. That's right. We're 683. Let's get it to 7750. You guys make sure and attend the conference. We're going to be all live. We're going to love to see you there. You can access it by going to this link, hoppin.com events solutions 2021. It is free for you guys to register. Come join us. We've got a bunch of great speakers. Uh, we've got Chris Marcus, Fernando Aguirre, Dr. Scott Craig, Andy Sheckman, James Anderson, Karen Van Hess. Chris Vermeulen, Jerry Huang, Alex Newman, Daisy Luther, Jason Cozens, and myself, Robert Keynes at goldsilverpros.com. Thank you guys so much. It has been my absolute pleasure. It's my first live stream. We'll get the kinks worked out, but thank you for all, all of you for joining. Come see us at the conference tomorrow. We'll do it again all day long. We'll have a blast. Till next time, we'll see you guys. Robert Keynes.